to articulate, even to those actors who say, we would love to play by the rules, but they're not fair. We'll never win anything if we play by the rules. To attempt to fashion arguments that say, killing civilians doesn't help you. Killing civilians doesn't get you any closer to that goal. And really, we can make the argument, yes, it's unfair. Yes, you are outmanned and outgunned and out-airplaned in almost every case we can think of in the world. But you also don't have rules that are as restrictive. The state is, this is the argument we often hear in Israel of BT, right? Israel will say, it's not a fair fight because we as a state have this many obligations, Hamas, just isn't supposed to directly target civilians, and they can't even abide by that. It's a decent argument, right, that it, as a state, Israel does have profoundly more obligations to the international community than it argues. So I think there are arguments that go both ways, but certainly I agree with you that um, <coughs> IHL is currently being directly challenged by some armed groups with a significant fan base, if you will, um, in ways that perhaps pre-internet it wasn't as possible to kind of disseminate this idea that there is a counter uh, strategy. There's a great video uh, by, I don't know if you've seen, um, he, they, he's called Al Amriki, the Al-Qaeda uh, fighter who was an American who converted and became an Al-Qaeda. He's, he's part of the um, uh, public service announcements that they sometimes take. And he has a hour-long lecture dedicated to international law in the United Nations. And he has footage from UN Security Council decisions and pictures of nice internationals having meetings in Geneva. And then he says, we have as much respect for your international humanitarian law as you have for our Islamic Sharia. Right? There's this sense of we are talking about two totally different paradigms, and it's a face-off, and that's how we see it. I think in practice, we find that a lot of groups don't actually seem to behave as though they completely reject the rules. So of course you have Al-Qaeda's and uh, plenty of other groups that behave in such a way that suggests they, uh, the total war is total war, there's all rules, all bets are off. But I think we also see many groups that seem at least to take seriously the idea that there is still some restrictions on their time. LRA is another example of a group that I think we have very limited indications that they are interested in regulations on their conduct, but many, many other groups seem to demonstrate that at least they want to look like they take the rules seriously. Anyone else? Okay, so let me uh, move on to, I'll come back to this about the UN and its obligations for sure, and we will come back to the uh, non-state actors issue as well. Let me say one word about an important distinction. I think this is the only Latin we'll have today. I hope it's the only Latin we'll have today. But that's the only way I can prove I'm a lawyer if I have at least one Latin phrase in my presentation. So this is a very important distinction and one that we tend to see people of all levels of its seniority getting wrong all the time. So I just want to understand. Use agabellum and use in bellum, the law of going to war and the law in war. Whether we think it still exists or not, international law has built a gigantic cement brick wall between these two bodies of law. And the wall functions as such. The law of going to war is a very strict set of rules about when it is or is not legal to engage in armed conflict against another state. So we all remember the debate about whether the U.S. invasion of Iraq was legal, whether Ethiopia's invasion activities in Somalia was legal, whether that was an invasion, whether it was an illegal war. This is an argument we hear about all the time, right? This is regulated almost solely by the Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. Whether or not a state can legally engage in armed conflict is within a pretty narrow set of terms. And in addition to Chapter 7, of course, self-defense. If the life of the nation is under threat, they can engage in armed activities to protect themselves. Okay. We're not talking about that body of law. It's a very interesting body of law, but that's not the body of law. Use in the 
what we are talking about today, is the set of rules that apply once war has taken place. So the traditional story to, to talk about this decision is to say, a bullet crosses a border, you're in Ayatollah. You're in use in the The reason the distinction is so important is the fault. Traditionally, in terms of Christian, early Christian and Catholic doctrines on war, Islamic laws of war, many traditions of war, the justness of the war determined the permissiveness with which the military could act. If your cause was just, if you were fighting the war for a good reason, then you could kill a lot more people because your cause was just. The advent of IHL was to say, we break the connection between those two things. It doesn't matter. Whether the U.S. invaded Iraq legally or not, we can have many interesting discussions about it, but for our purposes, if we're talking about access, if we're talking about protection, if we're talking about the role of the UN on the ground, we have to close our minds to that debate and say, no matter what, the same exact rules apply on the ground. The same rules apply to Iraq, and the same rules apply to the United States. Let me give an example of where I think we got this wrong. 2006 Israel-Lebanon war, Israel-Hezbollah war, as it's called. Uh, so, we heard many uh, UN agencies, senior NGO representatives saying the war is disproportionate because it was uh, argued that the cause for the invasion was the protection of the two kidnapped Israeli soldiers who had been taken by Hezbollah. And Israel is committing disproportionate crimes in the war as well. That is a conflation of these two concepts. Whether or not the war is illegal, whether or not it's disproportionate, whether it makes sense to invade a country to protect two soldiers, has nothing to do with what the law allows you to do once you're engaged in hostilities. So again, I won't belabor the point, but just to say, be very careful if you hear anyone making an argument that, well, we had to shell the village because these rebels illegally attacked the capital. Sure, they illegally attacked the capital. In almost every case, there's no question that a rebel group is engaging in illegal activity all over the place under domestic law. But still, the state cannot respond by shutting the village. They still have to abide by the same rules. In every case, no matter what. Uh, oh, that's terrible. Um, okay, that's not true. So, let me get into the principles, and I have not been paying any attention to time whatsoever, and I will continue to do that. So, um, here are the core principles of IHL. I want us to cover two things, and I'll try to cover them efficiently. Um, we're going to focus on a few of these, so I'm going to talk about the rules that apply in conduct of hostility, and then I want to talk about the principles relating to the humanitarian. So, let me say at the outset, what you will see, and if you are familiar with these rules from your other work, you will know. This body of rules is constantly in an internal tension. And that internal tension is between military necessity on the one hand. What does the military need to be able to do, however gruesome, in order to win the battle? And humanity on the other hand. What does the international community define as the unbreakable core of protection that no matter what, you are not allowed to do these things? And how do we balance those two? How much credence do we give to an argument of military necessity? We had to engage in that attack because it was critical to winning that battle versus our interest in humanity. And that's the doorway we're entering into, is the often ugly and often difficult balance between those two principles. And we'll see them from how you can engage in a bombing attack to how you can make an argument for food delivery behind the front lines. So let me say a few words first about qualification. Okay, so this is the favorite topic of IHL lawyers the world over. It's generally boring, but the impact of it is not boring. So qualification of armed conflict is a term that essentially means this. What kind of war are you in? And the law gives us four categories. 
And I am 